So. Okay, you can see my screen? Yep. Okay. Oh. Okay, so tonight I'm gonna to be talking about um, Asteraceae, daisies. And I just wanted to, make, oh, I did, I did click through too. Okay, um, so the Asteraceae is a large family. It's one of the three largest families of plants. So the other two, can anybody name any of the, the other ones? So, oh, you're, you're <laughs> muted, so that's okay. You've muted yourself, that's fine. Um, so the other, uh, so the, uh, the Poaceae, the grasses, and then in the tropics, the Rubiaceae, we only see a few Rubiaceae around in our area. So that, and, and of course the, uh, another one, big one in the tropics is, uh, um, the, oh, I just lost them. <laughs> anyway, so there the, are the four or five that are get into the, the range of 250, um, 25,000 species and more. So it's a big family. And I just put this slide up there because it shows um, how we name plants and, and how we arrange them into, into groups. And so within, within uh, the families of plants, we have, every time we, we have a plant that's in a, in a family, it always ends with A-C-E-A-E. -E. Now, back in the good old days, there were some variations. And so this is one where we have a variation, it's called composite. Uh, so composites is another name for, for the Asteraceae. Uh, and you might, see, you might see that in some, some books. It's a daisy family. Then the daisy family is divided up into three uh, subfamilies, and these are pretty large. The, um, there's the Lactuki, which is the lettuces, the Asteroidae, which is obviously where the asters are, and uh, then there's a whole group that has uh, no, no ray florets. Uh, like um, uh, I, I guess like like the Nathalie, the, the cud weeds and things like that. And so then within the the subfamilies, there are twenty tribes. And since we're following Aster, this this group is called the Asteri. And in America, there's about two hundred species. Uh, in the estuary. And then in the, uh, in the number of genera in the family is around about 1600. And the, in the genus Aster, there are none in the United States uh, and there are none in, in North America at all, apart from the occasional one that's being brought across and growing in somebody's garden and might escape. And uh, so, but the in the main, there are no true asters in the United States. Then uh, within the whole family, as I mentioned before, about 25,000. And because Linnaeus, who uh, in 1753 uh, wrote the book that basically set out the way we name things, um, chose the, the species Aster emellus uh, to be the type of the genus. And so it's then the type of the family as well. And so that's why the name Astra carries all the way through. And so you'll, you'll now see there are some uh, other names that are associated with Astras, uh, uh, which are our Astras. But first, let me talk about what makes a plant a daisy. And so the thing about daisies, I've got one in my hand here, because I am a botanist. And I, if, if we had, if we we're in person, then then I'd be handing out um, these plants, and and you'd be pulling them to pieces, so so you'd actually have a little bit more um, of an idea what we're talking about. Um, so the the thing about daisies is they all have little tiny flowers, and they're called florets because they're small, in heads or clusters or 
so these, these clusters all sit sessile on the top of a receptacle, basically a little platform. And so that's when you, when you dissect um, the head, you'll see that there's this receptacle flat, flat platform that has, or it might be, it might be uh, like a dome, but uh, more often it's, it's uh, fairly flat. And, and so all the flowers are sitting on the top of that. The flowers are pentamerous, they're in five, so the, the petals that are fused in, in uh, these plants, uh, there are five parts that are fused together and they're surrounded by bracts. And I, uh, let me just see uh, the next. Uh, Okay, I'll uh, show you what the bracts look like in a close up in a moment. Bracts are, are what form when they all together, they called the involucra. And so you'll see uh, in the keys, uh, you might look at maybe look at Newcomb or somebody, somebody like that. You'll see that these uh, bracts are really quite important when it comes to uh, looking at uh, trying to divide the species up. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, fillaries as well. So there's a there's a whole bunch of names, and unfortunately, with with uh, when you have um, when you're trying to key something out, then there's generally a good uh, uh, glossary that goes along with that. So and the the ovary is in what we call inferior, which means the parts. Can you see my little arrow there? The, the parts of the, the flower, which is you know, the, this is one petal here, um, are sitting above the fruit. Okay, and then uh, so in, in these plants, we would either have disc florets and ray florets or both. And we, in, the asteres, in the asters, we have both types. We have ray florets, which are the long um, ligulate ones, the ones that look like, um, like petals. And then there, there are disc florets, which have really tiny um, uh, teeth-like uh, petals in the middle. The anthers are what we call epipetalous, which means they sit between the, the, uh, where the petals would be fused. And then, the daisies have this ring of, of uh, hairs, and some of them are called trichomes, or, um, but they're, it's just called pappus. And the pappus may be present, and is generally present in probably about 90% of, of the Asteraceae. Some is reduced and some uh, completely missing. But in the, in the main, these are going to be there. So when you look at a Rebecca, say, the Rebecca have two little teeth here, which are the same thing as this, this uh, uh, pappus. Do you have any questions on that? Oh, you've all muted, so I'll take the questions at the end. Um, so, so now I want to talk just about uh, a little bit of confusion that we might have in, our, um, in the books that we're looking at. Um, the true name for the fruit of a daisy is uh, called a cipsella, um, which means it's a nut from an inferior ovary. And uh, a lot of books, uh, particularly American ones, have the name akeen. Well, the akeen is actually uh, the nut from a superior ovary. So in the superior ovary, the, the petals are sitting below uh, the ovary, whereas in, in the uh, um, an inferior flower, the petals are sitting above. These are dry fruits, they're winged, uh, sorry, they're ribbed, uh, occasionally winged. They're indehiscent, which is what a nut is, and it contains one seed, which is what a nut is. And the, uh, the pappus, which you see those little, like shuttlecocks running around here, the, the pappus is, are those little hairs that are uh, all uh, standing up. And I will come back to that in a minute because one of the names of our species, uh, what, uh, genera, is actually uh, takes the name from the pappas. Okay, so what makes a, an aster an aster? Well, this is a really difficult thing because a lot of, a lot of 
uh, genera are really easy to tell apart from, from most other things because they have uh, really outstanding features that you would see them and say, this is, this is a, um, a particular type of plant. Whereas with the asters, the characters that they have are quite broad and seen across a lot of different uh, genera. But this combination um, basically gives it away. Uh, so mo most of the uh, asters are perennials, which means that they have a, a root uh, system, uh, a rhizome, some part of the plant that's under the ground will grow back again next year. Uh, most of the asters are not um, in any way woody. Certainly the ones that are in America are not woody. Uh, so they're all what we call perennial herbs, herbs, I guess. Um, so the leaves, there's lots of different shapes for the leaves in, in uh, asters. Uh, chordate means heart-shaped. Sagittate means like, a, like an arrowhead. Obovate, like an egg standing upside down. Oblanceolate, like a, a, a lance that's standing upside down. And linear is just really narrow. Then the leaf margins uh, can be serrate, dentate, and, um, or entire, which means serrate means like a, like, um, a knife with little serrations on it. Dentate is like teeth. And entire means it doesn't have any of those. It's just a smooth margin. Uh, a lot of a lot of families just have one of the, no one of the, those or the other, and so that it can tell them apart really easily. The inflorescences. So this is a cluster of flowers. Um, look can look like a panicle, which is a panicle is uh, a repeatedly dividing. Um, branching system that uh, so so you get a continuous set of of, of uh, flowers at the ends of little stems. A corum is when when the panicle actually everything in the panicle the stems of the the of the um, of the the heads of flowers all come up to the same sort of height. Or maybe like a dome, so they're they're all around about the same height. So that's a corum. Uh, a capitulum. So that's another name for these heads uh, of flowers. So that we talk about the heads of flowers, and these are capitula. Uh, so, and the flowers, the number of flowers that may be associated, the number of little tiny florets, may be few to many. And many, I mean, like up uh, 90, and few maybe down to just half a dozen. Uh, ray florets are the, um, the ones that are spectacular, the ones that stand out. When you see uh, around the outside of the, of the head, you see those uh, in this, this particular uh, picture I have up here, the, these are the uh, ray florets. So these are the ones that stick out. And then the, um, the uh, disc florets are the ones that are sitting in the middle. And so with the asters, they're white, pink, lilac, purple, or, and blue. So if you found a, a, a plant that you thought was an aster and it's yellow, the, the ray florets are yellow, you have not got an aster, you've got something else. Uh, it might be a Maryland um, um, golden aster, or it might be um, a solidago or something like that. The disc florets, the ones that are sitting in the middle, they're going to be cream or yellow. And that's when they're, when they're, um, when they're flowering, but when they start to mature, and die back, they'll, they may go to purple. The cipsellas, as I mentioned those before, and you've seen them, um, they're long and narrow, oblong, usually pale brown, and the pappus has, is generally in three rows, so it's three rings of, of little tiny hairs. 
uh, bristles that are standing up. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to move to what happened with uh, Aster and why we don't have plants that are named Aster as in the you know, as genera in in, um, in America. So. Back in, back in the uh, 1970s and 80s, there, there are some, uh, some research done based on morphology and then moving into some isozyme work, which basically showed that the, uh, the plants that we had in the Americas were not the same things as asters in Europe. And so there's a discussion about how to move these things over to new genera or Existing genera when when some of them, some of the the, na the early names uh, existed because some people thought that they uh, you no know, were were different from from asters, but that wasn't really taken on. So Guy Neeson in the 1990s, so starting in around about 1993 through to 1995, started separating out the the uh, American asters from asters in, in Europe. So um, the, the genus Dollingeria uh, already existed from, from uh, somebody who thought that Dollingeria was different because it had uh, very few ray florets. It's named after Ignatius Dollinger from Dollinger. He was a Catholic priest who just had a, a, a lot of priests when they, when they traveled had uh, and was uh, stationed various places around the world, uh, had an interest in botany. That was, that was uh, uh, their pastime. And uh, so they would, they would pick plants and, and uh, then send them back to uh, European botanists and, and then they would be named. Okay, um, and so, so we have two of them in Maryland and of the, the genus which has seven species total. Eurybia uh, means uh, wide and few. And so uh, this genus, which has uh, 23 species recognized right now, six uh, in, in our area, um, wide and few probably means something to do with the uh, number of uh, ray florets, which are wide and which are few. And, but it, nobody, nobody anywhere says that that is exactly what the uh, author of this uh, genus had in mind. Ionactus, this are, these are the stiff asters. We have one stiff aster. Um, and ion means purple or violet, and actus means ray. So these are violet rays. So the ray florets are violet. Uh, Oclomena. Uh, nobody knows why um, Graham Greene decided to describe this genus with this name. Uh, he didn't say why, and he just came up with a name for it, and uh, um, he he didn't tell us <laughs> didn't tell anybody why why he had this name. Okay, um, then an, an odd uh, thing for <clears throat> these uh, daisies to have is silky fruits. And so this uh, next genus, which has, has only three species in it, and we have two locally, uh, Cercocarpus has silky fruits. And that's what the name means. Cerco means silky fruits is carpus. And then finally, the biggest genus that we have in North America is um, Symphotrichium. Symphotrichum. So there are 25 uh, species in our area. Uh, 90 in the United States, and it means hairs growing together. So this, these are the trichomes, the, the pappus um, being uh, compacted and fu uh, not fused, but, but a whole bunch of them growing together. And so that's what that means. So when, you, when somebody says symphotrichum, you know, uh, now know what that, that they're actually talking about. They're talking about the pappus. Okay. I'm uh, now going to uh, just go through um, what we have uh, in uh, our 
local flora. And I'm not going to go, I'm not going to touch on every one, but I, I'll um, probably, it's a, of the 25 species we have locally, I'm going to touch on about 16 or 17. Okay, so just starting off with uh, what we call the white top asters. So this is Dolingeria, Symphiocarpus and Ionactus. Uh, so this is a group um, that is, is quite different from most of no, the, the other asters, and we'll probably see that as we go through. Um, so this is Dolingeria, and it has a very few wide um, uh, rays, as you can see there. The, um, the, the bracts that are underneath here are, are quite flat against the, um, the head. And so this is one of the things that really uh, shows this uh, part. This one is, is uh, a, a reasonably common species. Um, it's uh, found in the um, dry to moist areas and it attracts a lot of in, uh, insects, pollinators. It tends to, to prefer part shade to full sun corn leaf white top. We have this growing in the greenhouse, I believe we still had some. I, I collected some, we've been bulking it up, so I'm not sure it's been on, on our list for sale yet. Uh, Dongeria umbellata, this is a species that we don't have uh, in cultivation, but it's, uh, um, but again, th this, this species we don't have because it's uh, one of the mountain species uh, and it doesn't really get in down onto the uh, into the Piedmont and coastal plains. So that's one, the reason why we don't have it. Um, and it's the host to the Harris's checker spot, which is uh, a, an endangered butterfly uh, for, for Maryland. And uh, the, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's only just hanging on, let's put it that way. It's, uh, but anyway, uh, if if we had more of this growing, the the plant growing, then then uh, the caterpillars would be probably on that. Okay, uh, next one I'm going to is Ionactus, the flax top, uh, white top. Even though it's called white top, it's uh, actually a um, it has a blue flower, a bluish purple, and the pearl. Crescent larvae, crescent larvae eat the, the leaves of this. Um, you can see the butterfly and the, and the caterpillar uh, on the side there. Uh, this is a, a, a species that we find is fairly easy to grow. It grows in sandy soil, um, but we've had a lot of difficulty with insects uh, then coming and eating the, the seed before we can, we can get the seed. It's also called stiff aster is the other name for this, common name. Cericocarpus, uh, this one is, uh, we, we don't have, uh, yes, we do have this one. This is, this is one we do grow. Um, it uh, grows in, largely in the shade, not so much towards the sun, but uh, um, not full shade. So it's, it's a, a, a margin, uh, likes to be on dry uh, and it gets into the pine barrens a little bit. So the, the serpentine soils more. And uh, then the narrow leaf uh, white top. This is, I put this in there because it grows um, in the southern part of Maryland, it's uh, so. This is one you should be looking out for. And you can see that the, the this whole group, apart from from the uh, um, Ionactus, has just a few ray florets. So this one has what five or six or seven ray florets, and they're really quite narrow. Um, so this this uh, group, is, no, really does stand out from from. Uh, the, the main group of 
the rest of uh, what was Astra in the United States. Okay, um, so that's they're the outliers. They're the things that are the different. Oh no, we've still got some more yet. Uh, the Eurybias. These are the um, the wood asters, and the majority of these species. And I, I let's see if I can. Uh, I'm just trying. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'm trying to um, re reduce. There we go. Um, so I can see the whole screen. I was seeing just a whole lot of pictures down, of people down the side, and I just wanted to just point out here that. Uh, the I've given the the Maryland listing for for each of these species, and so S five means common, S four means um, becoming rare, S one is uh, in uh, endangered, uh, probably down to just one or one or two sites with maybe uh, fifty to a, to a hundred plants, uh, wherever it's occurring, and and so you can see that. Uh, of these two genera, we have just a couple of them that are really secure. And then the uh, on the side, they that I've indicated whether they're mountain, Piedmont, co inner coastal plain, or outer coastal plain. Um, and so there's a number of these we do not see uh, in southern Maryland. And uh, so I just wanted to mention that, um, but. Yeah, so let's let's go for uh, have a, having a look at some of these. Uh, this is compacta. Now, this is actually a rare species that occurs down in St. Mary's area. Um, and you now, if you get a chance in Southern Maryland to to look out for this, it's, this will be wonderful to find more localities. I think it's known from about five five locations in the, in the last hundred years that we have seen this. And uh, so, but it, it does occur in other places. It's it's um, on the eastern shore with uh, in um, in Delaware as well. So it's it's not on the edge of um, disappearing, but it's certainly very rare in Maryland. But do do look out for this. And so this is this is a, an odd view ruby because it likes to be in the sun. This is the common one that you'll find a lot. And so this, this species, um, Eurybia divericata, the white wood aster, excellent species for growing in the full shade. Uh, it really doesn't like the sun at all. Uh, so even part shade might, no, it does grow in part shade, but full shade is, is the, the perfect place for it. Uh, if you go up to Winterthur, um, you'll around the house there. This is the species that they have basically as the understory uh, covering all the grounds under underneath the um, no, around the, the trees that are there. No, full, absolutely full shade and a spectacular plant. And it grows really, very well. And it's a great plant if you've got a shaded part in your garden. This is, this is a good place to, this is a good one to have a grow. As full flower right now. Um, so this Oclamina, um, this is a this is a, another species that's in um, it's it's uncommon, and uh, we don't have it in cultivation in the greenhouse, uh, but it's it's another one that uh, is. Uh, forest species likes full shade. Uh, it's in the wetter areas, um, and it prefer it does prefer uh, rocky sites if 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 you can find them in um, in the lower areas, but certainly up towards the mountains. And then this is a this is another this is a species that is right on the coast. Uh, in in coastal areas, this is called bog aster. <clears throat> it's very rare. Only known from one record in Maryland. Uh, it's on 
Matt, this this will be at the very southern end of its its range. So one could anticipate that this species is going to be moving north and moving away from us. Um, it's a uh, it's a very nice species. We I believe we have some growing in the greenhouse um, that we haven't put on sale because I wanted to know what it's going to turn out to be <laughs> when we when we collected it. But I, I'm pretty sure what we have is uh, is this. Uh, it's an S1 plant, so it's so we can't actually sell this plant um, because that's one of the regulations we have. You're not allowed to sell S1 plants, uh, but it's a great plant to to watch out for, um, particularly in the you know if you if you round um, some of the fresher inlets, freshwater inlets. Okay, and now. Um, with that, I'm going to go on to talk about the the uh, the Cynthia trichums. So, as I said, there's uh, 25 of these in uh, Merand, and uh, what I've done is basically divided these up. These are a really difficult group to to work on. To to um, some of them are very hard to to identify. Um, but you'll find that some of these are out in flower right now and uh, you'll notice them. There are about three species that are really quite common and uh, you just have to watch out for them to see, to see what they are um, and, and how to tell them apart. So, so they're um, so Ericoides is supposed to be infrequent, but I don't believe that. I see that a lot of Ericoides around. Um, Lanceolatum is uh, supposed to be frequent, but I don't see very much of that at all. Um, Laterifolium is everywhere, is frequent. Uh, Pylosum is pretty much everywhere. This is uh, Another white aster that one would mix up with with others. Um, we call this one frost aster, and uh, the uh, racemosum similar again, but a different a different sort of habitat for that. Then um, these other three at the bottom are really quite. Um, Rare the 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 ones around the fresh the freshwater the eastern salt marsh aster we don't get up into an area because we're not sitting on salt marsh one's a perennial and the other one's an annual so let's see what these are um, ericoides uh, this has when when you see it lots of dense flowers all together. Um, very pretty in flower right now, very busy with, with insects uh, all over it. Lots of bee flies, some bees, but mainly um, half a dozen species of bee flies are all over this right now. Uh, full flower, it's very beautiful. Then um, the Lanceolatum, as I was mentioning to you, uh, this, this is also, this is, Supposed to be common, but I, I don't see this one as, as a, a common flower that they, as they would have it. Um, the it has a few heads, long leaves, and uh, it's the host to the pearl crescent lava, um, as you can see there. Really nice uh, native butterfly. I do see a lot of the butterfly around, so obviously. Um, some of these asters, particularly in this group, are, are, are being the host for, for this plant, uh, for this butterfly. The calico aster, uh, this, is, this is the other one that's really quite common around right now. Um, Laterifolium, which but one of the things about these asters is they may have really small leaves at the top of the plant, but the leaves down the stem may be quite quite large and quite long and sometimes quite broad. And so, so 
Um, depends on what part of the plant you're looking at for, for these, uh, uh, for the shapes of the leaves on these plants. So when one's trying to determine the, you know, the plant from its leaf morphology, one is really up, has an uphill battle. But this one in particular, see, see the, has a few florets, a few ray florets, and a lot of, uh, of dis, disc florets with, that turn this sort of purple in, in the middle uh, after a day or so, so as they fade. Um, the frost aster is quite distinctive because the, the flowers are quite well separated and usually one on the end of each stem. And I you know I, I hope everybody's voted. I walked up to the post office today and put my, my ballot in. And on the way I saw this and I actually took the photograph on the, uh, the, the top right of this frame uh, and put it into the, the PowerPoint uh, because I, I saw that that was there. And it's just perfectly in flower. And uh, so, this is one of the, the common species that, that's around this time of the year, particularly uh, frost aster. Okay, so they're the white ones. Um, and now I'm going to get to talk to about the, the bluish ones. And, and the ones we have um, in the south is concolor which uh, is a rare species. And this is one you could be looking out for in Southern Maryland um, because it, it is really quite rare. Uh, then the common blue wood aster, rare on the coast, uh, a little bit, of, it's infrequent on the inner coastal plain, frequent on, uh, in, the, um, in the Piedmont. A quarterfolium, as it suggests, the, the leaves are chordate, chordate leaves, so the heart-shaped leaves. Um, then I'm going to skip over Drummondia, which we won't see because it's uh, not more mountain and it's rare. Uh, Symphotrichum levi is a uh, smooth blue aster. We have this in the greenhouse. It is, um, a Piedmont species largely, and it's it's in the uh, uh, the inner coastal plain. Uh, so so an area where above an inner coastal plain is, is basically above uh, thirty meters above sea level, and uh, so th this one is uh, really quite. Uh, it's, I, I see it a little bit more than an S3. I, S3 means um, that you know, the, the research isn't in to know whether this is endangered or not. Um, and then sk I'm going to skip down to undulatum, the <clears throat> wavy leafed aster. It's uh, supposed to be frequent. This one I don't see very much at all. And uh, the uh, dumosum uh, is also. Um, I don't see this one very much at all, too, even though that, that uh, uh, is supposed to be quite common. So let's just go to have a look at what some of these things look like. Um, so this one has uh, the eastern silvery leaf. This, this is quite rare, as I was saying, and um, it's it's very a very pretty flower, and this one sort of goes from a uh, this pink across to purple, and uh, uh, again it's something uh, coccinimus. We need to to look look out for this. The blue uh, common blue wood aster, um, and I yeah, so. This one is has um, is is more for wetter places. Quarterfolium um, has has the, the cordate leaves, as I said. But see, notice that the the leaves that you are seeing in this photograph on the left do not look cordate. 
because it's the lower leaves that are chordate and not the upper leaves. And so one can be tricked. And that's why I'm saying the leaf morphology is, is not a good thing to, to work with for, for these, uh, this group. Smooth blue aster, um, the stems of this are, are really smooth. Uh, and uh, so there are no hairs on them. Uh, the, the leaves are slightly, uh, slightly wrap around the stem, and, but nowhere near as much as a New England nester, which we're going to come up to in a moment. Uh, this one is a really easy one to grow, beautiful, uh, really dense flowers, as you can see, lots of heads all together. So now we've moved away from the from plants that had smaller ray florets, and the, that last group that I showed you had had some larger ray florets, and and so now we get to the purples, the purple asters, um, that no, really the, they really stand out a lot. And so let's have a look at what some of these things are. And these these are a little bit more common um, than than the others, in particular. New England Esther, um, New York, and then skipping down to uh, uh, Peyton's is a really beautiful one. It has the biggest of the, the flowers uh, of, of any of the asters that we have. Um, and uh, we've been bulking this up. We've, we've got some, have, I got some seed from a plant so a couple of years ago, and we've um, been growing this uh, up a little bit more. And uh, Punicium, uh, the purple stemmed aster, which somehow crept into the purple asters, uh, um, but it's purple stem, but it has a lighter flower. And you'll see that um, that's the last of our slides when we get to that. So New England aster, probably everybody knows this, um, that it's, uh, this is one, the, this is just about the tallest of our asters, gets to at least four foot high. And, and uh, when, ah, when deer don't get it, I shouldn't, I should have said that symphotrichum, you know you've got a symphotrichum if the deer come through and eat it. The other ones that I was talking about before, the Eurybias and and uh, Dongerias, the deer don't like, and and so uh, they, these symphotrichums are like deer candy, and so uh, with Belgii, which is another Belgii, which is the New York, and uh, Oblongifolium. Did I skip over? Uh, Okay, wonder what happened to New England. Maybe it's out of order. Um, then Oblongifolium, um, much shorter, denser. Again, nice big flowers, full sun for this one. Uh, most of these are, and this has the silver checker spot. Looks very similar to the uh, to the pearly pearl checker spot, but um, you'll find this one around too. Uh, here's New England. And uh, so this is this is really the tallest one of the the whole bunch. And and you now if, if deer don't get to this, this will get to at least four foot high, and um, maybe even up to six feet. But I find that the deer try try, try to trim it. Uh, we we have one plant that's a sport, what we call a sport, and it's. Uh, growing in our garden beds at uh, Chesapeake Natives. And it's, it's actually a pink. And so you really can't um, you know, go by the color so much on this uh, for the identification. But, but I would say 99% of, of all New England masters that I see um, are this uh, really rich uh, lilac to purple color. Patterns, as I mentioned, this is this is uh, uh, an, another species that that uh, this is the latest, the the last uh, of uh, in the season. It gets all the way through to November. Has 
uh, flowers that are up to uh, about an inch across. And these, these are the largest of the, um, of the symphotrichums. And uh, it's a, a really wonderful species. And finally, um, Punicium. This snuck in because I was just doing a sort on color. <laughs> and so, um, and it went into purple, but it's really a, um, a, a lilac to a lighter color. Um, again, a late season. It does get quite tall. And, uh, and, and that's largely because it grows uh, in wet soil. And so it's great for rain gardens and uh, will, um, yeah, it, it just it just gets to be um, very tall, supported uh, by all the plants that are around it. And uh, that's uh, that's my story. And I'm just finishing up here with just a really good close up of uh, these filleries, these bracts that are sitting underneath the the flowers, uh, the cluster of heads, the ray florets, as you've been seeing and uh, the disc florets sitting in the middle and the you can see anthers are sticking out the top of this and uh, so there we go i'm stopping my share and i'm open for questions well there hasn't been any in the chat <laughs> Can I ask about um, the Nippon or Montauk daisy? Which? Montauk. Montauk. Also called Nippon, N-I-P-P-O-N. -P -P okay, so that's an introduced daisy. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what would you like to know about it? Well, just what, what you think about it. Apparently it was... Um, um, brought in and Montauk, New York is where it really has established itself. Uh, somebody gave me some, so I have them blooming right now. Okay, I'm just doing a quick search on that. Um, well, I guess because they're, um, they're not native. Yeah, this is Nipponanthemum. It's, it's related to the Chrysanthemum group. Right. And uh, so the this one I do see, yeah, I see, actually, now you show it to me, I, um, I see this one in, in people's gardens as I'm walking around. Um, so I would, as, uh, because I know I don't grow anything that's not native, <laughs> so, uh, that is, it's not spreading, it, it hasn't, it, um, it doesn't seem to be producing um, uh, viable fruits and, and getting around so right it's not it's not a real threat um, to getting out though it's it says um, here it's naturalized uh, on seashore along seashores in New York and New Jersey right, right. so it is, it is getting away uh, which is basically well, the way we get invasive species by by people bringing them in and and the thing about um, with invasive species, when, when so whatever is generally the pollinator of these of these plants has to be here as well, and right. so if it's got a, a special pollinator that's associated with that plant, then um, then basically it has to wait for for the pollinator to catch up with the with the species before it becomes a real problem. And uh, so I would, I would suggest, uh, and it's nice, nice daisy, but um, uh, one, it's it's not an aster, <laughs> um, but yeah, I would, I would be reducing it and pla replacing it with something else. But then it's such, such a spectacular species, and it's a bit like chrysanthemums, and um, you know, basically other mums that are around at this time of the year. So. Uh -huh. It's nice to have. Yeah. Okay. I only have three plants, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and now you have 30 people on the call and each one wants one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Good. Uh, 
Suzanne asked in the chat, uh, how many times can you cut the New England aster so it's not leggy in September? Um, you can cut it back really quite regularly. I, so I see the deer come through and trim our plants to around about three foot high, and then they come through again and trim them to about three foot high. And so they stay around about the same height. I think you can keep on trimming them. And, but you, you shouldn't trim them you know, when they, to, as they approach flowering, time for flowering. So when, when they're putting on the, uh, the shoots that are going to turn into flower buds, then you should stop, uh, stop trimming. But you can, you can trim them pr uh, pretty, pretty um, aggressively earlier on in the year. Um, yeah. So that, that's, so uh, how many times can you do it? I would know maybe two or three times as a maximum, but you know, you should just make sure that you're just keeping the plant to whatever height you want to have it to grow. It would, would grow uh, to be quite tall otherwise. Uh, four foot high is, is um, pretty much a freestanding plant. Uh, And then maybe the deer will help too, who knows? <laughs> well, the deer, if you've got deer, then they would love to help. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Carla asked, um, I'm not, uh, Carla, what were you, are you, are you able to unmute and clarify um, about what publication you're? He was looking at a book. Uh, so so uh, I, I mentioned uh, Newcomb. Uh, Newcomb's, is now probably out of print, but it's but it's such a a, a good um, book that's really comprehensive. Uh, it it has everything still named Aster because it's it's prior to 1990, um, and so one just has to go through and, and sort them up into what we're now calling them. But they so the book calls calls Master and. The, the good thing about it is similar to the way that I arranged the, the talk tonight, it um, bases the, the, uh, the plants on color, the, the, the flower colors, the ray, the ray florets, um, which is, you know, the white ones are always white. <laughs> and the color, the, 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 the blues through pinks through purple, they, they can be quite variable. Um, and Newcomb does a good job on, you know, with, the, with really quite simple illustrations of, of virtually everything that, that he's describing. Short descriptions, not, uh, not overly scientific. Um, so, so you know, if you can get a hold of a copy of that, they're, they're probably around um, maybe, a, maybe five to ten dollars uh, um, through the secondhand store or maybe on, on Amazon or something like that. Uh, the other book of course I, I use a lot is this guy as you probably know this is the floor of um, floor of Virginia um, that is online as well so uh, but the descriptions and, and uh, are not Unless you you know what you're really doing, it's not very accessible to, to most people. So. And then I, th I think there's the uh, uh, fish and wildlife um, book of which is still available. Um, it was available for about five dollars through through various uh, outlets for a while. And uh, so that has small illustrations of very many uh, of the species that, that I mentioned tonight. So those would be the three. three there's, a, there's another little booklet on coastal plains plants. Um, I, I, I have it downstairs in my library, but I, I don't look at it very much. Uh, but I do know there's there's one on coastal plains plants. It might be for Virginia, um, but uh, certainly it is uh, good for, for Southern Maryland as well. Cool. For all those resources. Um, Mary Graham is here tonight and she asked, are lower leaves reliable identifiers for gardeners? 
Lava leaves are the best um, for identification, yes, because they're, they're the ones that are usually measured. Uh, and Mary, you've got, got, always got to remember that um, the lower leaves are often associated with um, rosettes and as the plant gets to, to be growing out of the ground. And so those leaves uh, are going to wither quite early um, in a lot of plants. And so they may disappear. And so you may be only left with the, plant, the leaves from, from the middle middle of the plant and, and up. So, so the, the lower leaves you may, may lose uh, fairly early on in the season as, as the plants grow. And the, I think that certainly happens with, with uh, Symphotrichum punicium, um, the purple stem. Uh, you lose those, those leaves, but uh, that's a really easy species to tell apart from, from everything else. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure what Suzanne meant by until late August. Uh, I think Suzanne might have been helping someone with maybe the printing question. I'm not sure. Suzanne, are you still here? This is one video I saw suggested trimming down to three or four inches in spring. What? what? Is that the question to do with New, New England Aster? I, I would never trim, no, um, that's far too short. I would you know, maybe to two feet um, the, would be- The video I saw, the video I saw suggested that they you trim them as you said, like by a third, maybe two, three feet high, but in the very spring before, they really take off to, to trim them down to two to three inches. Huh. Well, okay, so so the, the uh, maybe talking about the dead stems from the previous year. Because, yeah, I, 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 that's, that seems to be very aggressive. Uh, for for a plant with new shoots coming out of the ground, I, I certainly not not want to hit them that hard for that low. Yeah, and the next one down, Judy K says, yeah, that's I'm new, referring to Newcomb's flower guide, and so the um, the last dozen or so pages are the the uh, the asters in in that guide. When is the best time to plant asters? So um, the best time is May. Uh, you should, these, uh, because they're, they're uh, fall flowering um, plants and so the, the seeds develop in the fall they will go through a winter um, uh, cool season. They, they need to be uh, in, in, basically if you're, if you're hot, carrying the seeds over, they need to be uh, kept at four degrees Celsius, 40 degrees Fahrenheit in a, in a moist um, environment in the, in the fridge. Uh, and then you bring them out and sow them. Uh, for, no, just as the soil warms up in April, if you're going to grow them from seed in the ground. Can you tell? Yeah, so you can tell the, the buds look like um, a little white. Um, um, <laughs> Almost like the tips of of uh, um, the earbuds, ear um, ear tips. Ear tips, yeah. Those those they're, they're a little bit smaller than that, but that's what they they look like. Uh, but they'll be green uh, mostly, and then they'll start to turn white. And so you you'll see those coming on, and they'll 
you know, depending on the color that they go to, and you'll, you'll see that they go to, to a purple or to you know, stay white. Yeah, and, and so she's thinking late August, and that's about, well, for most of the species. So uh, the thing about the asters, uh, they are fall flowering, and that's why I had that, that uh, stars, stars are falling <laughs> at the beginning because they're fall flowers. So it's just a, uh, catch a falling star. So basically, they always fall. Uh, so uh, August through till to November is when the asters are. Some of them are earlier, some of them are later, but, but that's the time of the year when we have the asters. Um, I was wondering why you had that title. I should have asked, but <laughs> it's a title. Um, and then you see Jan's, uh, Jan wrote that most fall blooming plants shouldn't be cut back past early to mid July. That's why, that's what she does for mums and asters. Yeah, that, that's that's reasonable. And that's, so, yeah, most of the, the leaf growth and the height is, is uh, from from May through till till July, and then then they'll sit and start to mature. So so if you're going to trim them back, you should be doing that in in uh, in June and no later than July. Um, well, I don't, I don't see any more questions. Um, I guess if you have any more questions, if you want to unmute to ask, uh, please feel free to do that. Of course, if you have any questions, you can come and volunteer at the greenhouse and learn everything you ever needed to know about growing asters. <laughs> I have a quick question. Who's that? Um, is uh, are you still selling, or are you closed for the season? No, no, we're still selling. We're still oh, okay. selling plants, and and basically the principle is. Um, a plant knows when it start, wants to start growing and when it wants to stop growing. And so when, if you've got a plant that's in a, in a quarter or a gallon, it's just going to wait in the ground until spring comes around. Uh, rather than, you know, waiting for us to, to get up the momentum to put them in the ground in the spring. So we, we sell, we'll probably sell for another um, I guess probably until the request stop, or no, we'll probably be even selling gift cards all the way through uh, through the winter. Okay. Yep. Where's the greenhouse? Okay, the greenhouse is in uh, it's in Rosarial State Park, off uh, between. Uh, 301 and Woodyard Road and um, Route 4, basically in that. So just to the east of Andrews, and, uh, Andrews Air Force Base. Um, if anyone's a history buff, it's uh, near Mount Airy Mansion. It's like the mansion's there and then it's like the swimming pool is where Chesapeake Natives keeps all um, the aquatic plants and the tennis court is where perennials are. So it's it's definitely cool to go see. Um, yeah. Jan said she bought plants from you recently and loved the process. Easy to order online and pick up. Yeah, all orders are online right now. Yes, and the favorite word for the uh, th uh, three words for the year is because of COVID. <laughs> yeah. It comes up all the time. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we do sell. And the, the reason we don't sell uh, seed and, well, seed we can't sell because uh, we have to show that the seed are viable. Um, it's a Maryland state law that you have to do the testing on seed to, to sell it. And um, testing a batch of seed costs about $140. And uh, so it's a substantial amount of money for, for each species, and we have something like 160 odd species that we're growing. Uh, then, of course, um, we guarantee our plants uh, so that if you put a plant, uh, because it's a gallon or a quart, um, 
we want to know that it, it grows um, and we're happy to replace plants that don't. So as long as you may, make sure that you water them. <laughs> and I know you guys really do. Um, okay, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, if you could only choose one or two of these species, which ones would you choose? Uh, and so I would I would certainly choose uh, for, for shade. I would uh, ch certainly choose uh, Eurybia, uh, the Vericata. So so the, the white wood aster for the shade. Um, that's certainly when I put that. And then uh, for full sun, um, as long as you haven't got deer around, I would go for um, either the New England aster or the, the New York aster. Uh, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying no, don't buy the, uh, the, the frost asters, but the frost asters will come in. <laughs> You'll probably have them already growing around your garden. Um, but if you want a bigger variety, then we can get the other ones to you. But uh, um, and so you know, certainly for this time of the year, uh, the frost asters are, are, are really the, so dynamic with, with everything, you know, the, the insects that are going crazy on them right now. Native, these are native uh, um, bee flies and flies and, and uh, bees. Uh, the bigger bees, the bumblebees are not so much around this time of the year, but you do see a few. But the, uh, no, the honeybees and everything else are, and smaller are still around. Thank you. Well, I, I think that is all of the questions. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, you know where Mariah is, and she can always ask the questions for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for presenting, Chris. Appreciate yeah, not a problem. <laughs> yeah, I have one on solidagos. I have one on so many other species, which which we will be producing from the greenhouse uh, as soon as we set up there to do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, well, free, uh, I'll leave you to your uh, business meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, have fun. Thanks, see you later, bye. Okay, bye. Okay, so um, I guess you guys wanna take like a five minute break just to stretch a little, get some water. Um, thank you everyone who's not from Calvert County for attending tonight. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take a five minute break and then we'll get to Calvert County's monthly meeting uh, portion of this Zoom meeting. Um, if anyone, has any questions just let me know um otherwise have a have a good evening and see you at the next zoom meeting <laughs>